Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm sure you guys will review this more on the recording side, it sounds like. Um, but I'm happy to introduce Dr. Johnson. He has given um, numerous lectures before in um, the vascular um, and interventional radiology interest group uh, meeting before. Um, and so today he'll be giving a lecture on interventional oncology, which he's actually given before. Um, and it was definitely requested to be given again. So really excited um, to get started and I'll give the floor to Dr. Johnson. Okay. So um, all of you have obviously heard of interventional radiology. Or which... So today we're talking a little bit about interventional oncology. And... Um, and so when we're talking about interventional oncology, we'll talk a little bit about the definition of what that is it actually um, some of the history some of the current therapies that we and then also a little bit on future directions just so you know that this is a growth field and not something okay in fact it turns out that you know drags more heavily in heavily so what the heck is interventional oncology right um well you know it's uh a offshoot of interventional radiology which is a relatively young uh field so well, this is werner forsberg who um, at the time in the 1950s was believed that if you actually catheterized a vein, it would cause spasm of the vein and then the patient would die. And so we did it in animals, but we didn't do it in people. And a young surgeon actually thought that that was wrong. So he did a cut down on his own arm. That's a picture of actually doing a cut down on his own arm. And he put a catheter in, and this is a picture of the x-ray um, that they took of him after he put the catheter in. So possible to actually navigate inside of the body using um did not die did get he did actually get um, he lost his medical license to practice in Germany because he was an intern at a uh, second year but he actually won the nobel prize so i guess that's kind of a fair trade but uh it, anyway that was sort of the beginning of interventional radiology and really uh, interventional radiology really, really started in 1953. That was 1951. In 1953, um, you know, we really started to, or, um, in 1953, uh, with the Seldinger technique, this was kind of revolutionary. Because before this, anytime we wanted to access an artery or a vein, we would always do a cut down, expose the wall of the vessel, cut it open, put your catheter in, sew it into the vessel, and then when you were done, close it. And so the um, fact is the Seldinger technique, and this is the picture from the original, the actual original report in, basically the idea is you put a needle into the vessel, you get blood back, you put a wire down the needle, you take the needle off and you put a catheter over the wire. That was revolutionary. Then you didn't have to cut people open anymore get into their blood vessel. And so that led to, uh, you know, the 1963, really the lightning rod birth of um, interventional radiology with uh, Dr. Charles Dodder, who was exactly as crazy as he looks in this picture. In fact, his nickname in the IR community was Crazy Charlie, just so you know. So he was exactly as crazy as he looks in that picture right there. Um, and basically what he did was he did an angioplasty of a patient named Laura Shaw's foot who had gangrene, she was a diabetic with bad peripheral uh, disease. They, the orthos wanted to cut her foot off. She said, no, I'd rather die. And Dr. Daughter actually opened up the vessel and managed to save her foot. So she did actually die a few years later of pneumonia, but um, she actually saved her foot. And that was really sort of when, you know, interventional radiology went from being something diagnostic to potentially something therapeutic. Uh, the specialty was named in 1967 by Margulis, who was the most important radiologist at the time. He was the chairman of radiology at the University of California, San Francisco, and the president of the ACR at the time. And so basically, he considered interventional radiology to be manipulative procedures controlled and followed under fluoroscopic guidance that must be predominantly therapeutic or primarily diagnostic. So it could be either. And the most important part of that whole phrase that he said is this will require special training, technical skills, clinical knowledge, and the ability to care for patients. And so he really wanted it to be a part of radiology, though. Charles Dodder actually wanted to call it like image surgery or minimally invasive surgery, but he wasn't nearly as famous as Margulis as boss. So that's kind of how we ended up being in radiology. 
And, you know, we've ended up going into, and this is the Wikipedia definition of interventional radiology, medical subspecialty, which utilizes minimally invasive image-guided procedures to diagnose and treat, treat disease in nearly every organ and system of the body. And we kind of overlap with just about everybody, but I will say over the last several years, the, the biggest, the one that's taking over our workflow is actually oncology. We do more in this field of oncology than we do anywhere else in, um, in uh, uh, clinical medicine. And so when you look at the actual history of interventional oncology, you would think based on the fact that you're only hearing about this in the last you know, 10 years or so, even when I was a medical student, not very many people were talking about interventional oncology. Um, you'd think that this was something that was born like yesterday, but it turns out that actually, you know, Charles' daughter was doing Laura Shaw's foot in 1963, but IR was actually doing percutaneous embolizations of spine tumors back in 1966 to 1968. So, you know, you'd think, oh my goodness, you know, oncology hasn't been around that long, but it turns out we were doing that way, way back then. And it wasn't as fancy as it is now with our, you know, drug-eluting beads and you know, yttrium-90 and all that kind of stuff. At the time, they were actually using very small ball bearings or they were using macerated pig meat that they would use, they would grind up in the blender in the IR suite and then inject that into the spinal tumors to decrease bleeding. And so if we were doing it way back then, why is it only in the last 10 years or so that you're actually hearing about this? And it turns out, you know, we, you know, there was cancer care going on at the time. You had your medical oncologist, your surgical oncologist, and your pathologist. And I was like, hey, can I, uh, can I join? Can I be one of those pillars of care cancer care? And uh, the oncologist would say, oh, well, it's a systemic disease, so your local regional therapy, that's garbage. And if you talk to the surgeons, if you can't cut it out, then you really can't cure it, and you're not cutting anything out, so you're garbage. And if you talk to the pathologist, it was tissue is the issue. And back in the 1960s and 70s, remember, the CT scanner, the, the body CT scanner wasn't invented until 1981. And so back then, and uh, three or two-dimensional ultrasound was also not invented until uh, 1981, 1982. And so we really didn't, weren't doing a ton of biopsy at the point. And so basically, we also weren't satisfying the pathologist because we weren't, um, you know, tissue is the issue. And so basically we got the boot at that point. And basically oncology kind of went by the wayside for IR for many, many years until we started to get back into it in the early eighties, primarily through biopsy. But then um, with the advent of uh, transplant for liver cancer, all of a sudden we had a whole new population that were not surgical candidates who needed care that we could provide. And that was basically the cirrhotics. You know, these patients were too sick for surgery by and large. Until 2007, there was absolutely no medical treatment for HCC. So no chemos worked at all for these patients until 2007. Some patients did remain a candidate for transplant. You know, the original Milan paper demonstrating you could cure cancer by transplanting people, that came out in the 80s. And so we knew that we could save these people's lives by, by doing liver transplants, late 80s, 89, 80. 89-ish, 87-89. Um, but you had to get them to transplant and they needed treatment for their cancer in order to, to get them, you know, give them time to get a liver. <coughs> and this is still a huge problem, right? 26,000 cases per year in the United States annually. Only one out of 15 of these patients are candidates for curative therapy, which would mean um, surgery. Um, no, no medical treatment till 2007, as we said. 2007 is the year that serafinib came out. And most of these are in the context of cirrhosis, so they don't have a ton of hepatic reserve for you to blast them with, with chemotherapy. And then there are some very interesting peculiarities about cancer in this location in that they tend to be hypervascular, but they get their blood supply mostly from the hepatic artery. Whereas most of the parenchyma of the liver gets most of its oxygen and its blood supply from the portal vein. 75% of the blood supply from the portal vein and in a, in a Postprandial state, it gets 40% of the oxygen. In a um, fasted state, it actually gets 70% of the oxygen from the portal vein side. And so you could embolize the hepatic arterial side, kill the tumor because the tumor needs that blood, and you wouldn't hurt the rest of the parenchyma that much because it could use the portal vein blood to sustain itself. And then the other very interesting thing about HCC that made it different from anything else is that 75% of these patients die 
from HCC without it ever leaving the liver. And so this is a local problem that you can apply local regional therapies for, especially in a patient too sick for surgery. And so the first report of transarterial chemoembolization came in 1974. Um, and very interestingly, they embolized this tumor and they didn't even mention how the patient did. They just said, hey, look, we embolized a tumor. Isn't that cool? That was basically what the paper says. You can look it up if you believe me, but they don't even mention whether they knew what happened to the patient the day after the procedure. So very interesting. It got it was offered widely because there was nothing else you could do for these patients. And it was controversial at first because everybody's like, we don't even know this works. Why are we doing this? And that was until 2002 when um, Lovett et al. and Lowe et al. independently, uh, an Italian hepatologist and then an interventional radiologist from Korea simultaneously published papers that demonstrated that this was a, a, a procedure that we should be offering all of these patients. Currently a level 1A recommendation in every single algorithm. And the data, Lovett found that 82%, 63%, one and two year survival for TACE versus 63 and 27 for conservative therapy. And low, it was basically the same thing, except that he went out to three year survival. And so 26% three year survival versus 3% three year survival for best supportive care at the time. And so um, I don't know if any of you know a whole lot about cancer numbers, but those numbers are ridiculous relative to a lot of cancer therapies that we offer, you know, um, full Fox, full theory that we do for metastatic colorectal cancer don't have survival numbers anywhere near this good. And so the funny thing is Lovett's trial, he actually had to even stop it early because they reach, reached statistical significance and it was determined that it was no longer ethical to not give the taste to the patients in the control arm. And so this is actually now a part of care. And this is kind of what pulled us into the oncologic community and also started pulling us into tumor boards and that sort of thing. And that's kind of how all of this evolved into us doing more and more of this. And so this did really lead to a new paradigm shift. You still have the oncologist, you know, pushing their, their mustard gas on everybody. Um, you have the surgeons who are out there, you know, doing surgery to make sure that they cut out whatever they can. But now you also have the interventional radiologist right there in the middle, uh, helping by doing local regional therapies for a lot of these uh, kinds of diseases. And we really have basically become another, uh, and radiation oncology is also part of the, you know, uh, pillars of oncologic care, if we're gonna be real honest about it. But we, we became sort of equal partners to the oncologists, the surgeons and the rad onks in just in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And more so as time goes by, we become a very, very important part of their cancer care. So what kind of procedures are we talking about, right? We've already ta obviously talked about chemoembolization, but we also do radioembolization and bland embolization depending on the tumor types. Sometimes you're doing that for palliation. You can do bland embolization of bleeding tumors to stop the bleeding so the patients can go home, especially duodenal tumors and that sort of thing. Those spine tumors that I showed you, those can often bleed and cause cord compression. So you can embolize those to try to decrease that. We do chemoembolizations, not just for, the, for HCC, but also other kinds of tumors, including breast cancer mets. You can do um, arinotecan drug-eluting beads for metastatic uh, colorectal cancer. And then radioembolization, which we're doing more and more of, that's Y90. Um, and it's basically a beta emitting um, uh, embolic, which gives you the ability to give a massive dose of local radiation without irradiating the rest of the body because the effective range that you give the radiation is very limited with beta, beta particles. For ablation, you're talking about radiofrequency ablation, cryoablation, microablation, nanoknife or irreversible electroporation, which I'll talk a little bit about that. That's still relatively new. Alcohol ablation or other chemical ablation. Sometimes we do citric acid ablation, although that's more common in Europe than it is in America. And then bone cement injection, which doesn't seem like an ablation, but it actually is because the polymethyl methacrylate, which is the cement we use when we're doing kyphoplasties and that sort of thing, actually it turns out that it heats up and that actually results in some ablative effects. It actually heats up above 60 degrees, so it does ablate tissue. And then biopsy. Well, biopsy is not the sexiest thing in the entire world. The fact is, um, 
every tumor type now that they try to treat with immunotherapy, you have to have a molecular um, uh, 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 profile in order to do that. So there's no lung cancer that does not get a biopsy. There is no cancer in the abdomen that you're considering treating with immunotherapy that doesn't need a biopsy. And that means that we've had to get much more aggressive and um, also uh, better at biopsies because we're ending up doing biopsies all over the body and we have to do it in more and more difficult situations in order to make sure that patients have, uh, have access to um, the, the treatments that they need. And then something that's becoming more um, well uh, characterized over just the last couple of years and literally just the last couple of years um, are um, pain treatments for these cancer patients, right? Um, we're doing all kinds of interventional stuff, not just us, but the surgeons and the rad onks and the oncologists. And a lot of this stuff results in terrible, terrible pain. And um, there's lots of things that we can do to help these patients have less pain and decrease their opioid requirements, right? Which is good in terms of, you know, decreasing the opioid epidemic and also decreasing diversion of medications. But it also turns out that there's a lot of things we can do interventionally that actually give patients more relief than it's possible to give them with oral or even IV opioids. And in particular, things like intrathecal pain pumps, where you put the medicine directly on the spine, that can actually be cause massive pain relief without getting the same sort of snowing them under the methadone cloud that you do for a lot of end-stage cancer patients. And so this is becoming a more and more important aspect of interventional oncology care is actually helping the other services manage the pain associated with a lot of these treatments. Okay, so what are we talking about embolics? Embolic just means to block up, you know, it's like an embolism, a pulmonary embolism is a clot that came from somewhere else and then went to the lungs, right? And so these embolics are something that came from somewhere else that we're then putting into organs. And we do this in the liver, we do this in the uh, kidneys, we do this in the lungs sometimes. So there's kind of embolization that we do all over the body. We do it for spine tumors preoperatively. We do it for especially renal cell carcinoma. They will often ask us to embolize long bone or spinal renal cell carcinomas because those bleed like stink when they try to um, uh, surgerize them. And so they often need us to, to, to put embolics in them first to make sure that they can actually cut it out safely. And the drug eluting beads are very interesting in that they are loaded with a chemotherapy and then they slowly give off that chemotherapy in the, in the setting of HCC, you load it with um, uh, either uh, doxorubicin or epirubicin and you actually have therapeutic doses of chemo constantly at the site of the bead for over a month. And so you're really giving an incredibly high local drug effect. But the beautiful thing about it is that actually those drug eluting beads, the dose of um, uh, doxorubicin that the systemic circulation sees is so low that um, you actually don't even have to count it to their lifetime limit for doxorubicin. Because doxorubicin causes dose-related um, cardiac toxicity and causes congestive heart failure. So actually, if an oncologist gives doxorubicin, they have to sort of record it in the patient's chart because there's a lifetime maximum they're allowed to give. But I can give 150 milligrams of doxorubicin loaded on beads, and they don't even have to count it because it, it turns out you see so little in the systemic circulation that they never lose their hair, and um, it doesn't cause any increase in cardiac toxicity. So that's sort of the beauty of these drug eluting beads. And we can also use a rinitecan, and we use that primarily in the setting of metastatic col colorectal cancer. Even a rinitecan resistant metastatic colorectal cancer, turns out that you get a 22 month survival benefit by doing embolization with drug eluting beads with a rinitecan, because you know, it's a dose response kind of issue, right? They become resistant to a rinitecan, but you can get so high in terms of your dosimetry that um, it overcomes it and they get a tremendous survival benefit. Although they're not happy with you because it does actually cause really bad um, uh, side effects for about an hour after the procedure. Lipiodol is a liquid um, uh, sort of lipid. It's actually derived from poppy seed oil, but it's loaded with iodine so you can see it on, um, on x-ray. And you can actually load just about any chemo you want into lipiodol. And you do it by mixing the aqueous solution with the lipiodol and it makes tiny bubbles or micelles of 
chemo and that lodges in tumors. And so we can do that for just about any tumor type and you can almost do it anywhere in the body. Um, you know, we, we use it in the liver all the time for chemoembolization, but um, I'll tell you, there's a lot of really interesting recent data looking at lipidol for pancreatic head tumors, because those are very notoriously difficult tumors to treat. And so even in terms of what you can do with lipidol, it's an embolic, but then your body can actually, you know, clear it out because it's cleared by the uh, lymphatics which is why it's handy because tumors don't have lymphatics, whereas the rest of the body does. And so it's a very effective uh, embolic. It actually was the very first contrast agent ever invented at the Paris School of Medicine in 1903 by Dr. Gerbet. And then bland embolic particles, we have all different kinds of particles that um, we can use to actually embolize, and they come in all different sizes. And so we decide what organ we're treating and then how big we want the particles based on what the goal is. And then, as I said, yttrium is a beta emitting particle. But the beautiful thing is you get zero radiation dose greater than one centimeter away from the particles. And so I can embolize a tumor in the liver and they will never get a skin burn, no matter what dose I use, because um, yttrium doesn't uh, let the radiation go very far away from the particles. And so, you know, interarterial treatments, we have really, really good evidence for HCC. We have really good evidence for neuroendocrine. Level one e evidence for colorectal cancer, levative, level one evidence for hypertrophy, <coughs> and I'll talk more about that in a second. Metastatic uveal carcinoma, significant survival benefit, and then everything else, we do it sometimes, but the evidence is less um, uh, robust. For Y90, there's actually decent evidence for basically any adenocarcinoma, but um, it's still not like prospective, randomized, level one kind of stuff. So. Uh, the, the level of evidence gets a little dodgier the farther you go down. HCC, obviously, as I said, is super common cause of cancer death. Uh, more common outside of the United States where they don't vaccinate for hepatitis B, but um, still incredibly important here, and that's why this is a major component of our practice. Um, and you should know that the reason that we're doing this and the surgeons aren't operating on all of this is almost all of these are in the setting of cirrhosis, with the exception that you can sometimes see um, cancer before cirrhosis with hep B, which doesn't happen in the United States very often, and so wouldn't be operated on here in most cases. And then with metabolic syndrome, you often see cancer before you have cirrhosis. The problem is the patients with metabolic syndrome, the reason they have metabolic syndrome is they're um, uh, a little on the chubby side. And so they're often not ideal surgical candidates but that doesn't bother us all at all in terms of chemoembolization. And you know, it's pretty, com it's pretty um, common to develop cancer in the setting of, of cirrhosis, right? And while you think, oh, well look, HCC or HCV is the number one reason for cirrhosis in the United States. So we expect with the advent of DAAs, direct anti antivirals, don't call it Harvoni. You lose cool points with hepatologists if you call it Harvoni, you gotta call it DAAs because there's like seven or eight different ones and nobody uses Harvoni anymore actually because they added extra enzymes after they developed Harvoni. So call it a DAA. After the advent of DAAs, we can cure hepatitis C, but if they have cirrhosis, they still get cancer. And that metabolic syndrome bucket that I told you about that are developing cancer as well, that bucket is getting bigger and bigger. And so the incidence of HCC has been increasing at about 5% per year for the last 10 years and it hasn't mattered, like it didn't even dip a little bit when we started curing hep C. And so this is an issue that we're gonna have to be dealing with in interventional radiology, sort of on an ongoing basis because all these metabolic syndrome patients, they're gonna get cancer and it turns out that's gonna cause a massive increase, not a decrease in HCC, but it's gonna be in people who are not particularly great surgical candidates because of their size as much as anything else. So I talked a little bit about hypertrophy. So when I'm doing, you know, there's solid evidence that if you have metastatic cancer to the right lobe of the liver from colorectal cancer, we take out the, the primary colon cancer and then we take out the right lobe of the liver, that massively increases your survival. It's like seven years. So it's, it's really, really a good thing in those cases to do a hepatectomy for metastatic cancer because it's such an incredible survival benefit. The problem is if you don't have enough left lobe, 
then you can't get your surgery because there's not enough left lobe left in order to, to get the, you know, to save the patient, to allow them, you know, your liver will hypertrophy if I cut a chunk of it out, but I, I still have to have enough liver left to live on while it's growing back. And so we will often do things like yttrium 90, or in this case, you can see all the bright stuff in the liver is because they did what's called a portal vein embolization. And in this case, it didn't work. Like the left lobe is still way too small to do an operation on this young guy who has metastatic colorectal cancer and no left sided disease. And so we did um, Y90 and you can see that's this is the same liver here as here. And you can see the right lobe is a lot smaller, but that left lobe is huge relative to it tripled in size. And so this allowed this patient to get to potential resection because he now has enough liver to get to resection. And so, you know, we work pretty much hand in hand with the surgeons as well as the oncologists in taking care of these patients because um, we can help them to get to surgery when surgery is the best treatment for them. And you can see also all of the holes, all the dark, dark stuff in the right lobe of the liver on this guy it's because we cooked all his tumor at the same time. So we treated his tumor at the same time that we actually grew his left lobe so he could potentially get surgery. And so Y90, the really cool thing about it relative to external beam radiation is you're doing it intravascularly, right? And remember how I told you at the beginning that um, HCC, and this is true for METS as well, they're getting all their blood supply from the hepatic artery, whereas rest of the parenchyma is getting most of their blood supply from the portal vein. That means they're hypervascular relative to the rest of the liver. So even when I deliver this yttrium 90 to the whole liver, you get way, way more of the yttrium 90 in the tumor than you get in any of the background liver. So you even get sort of a uh, consolidating effect where most of the radiation actually ends up in the tumor, which protects the liver, especially in some of these patients with um, poor liver function. And just to give you an idea of the relative doses you can do, um, for SBRT for um, liver, if you're doing SBRT for liver um, for HCC, the doses you can give are between 37.5 and 60 gray. Above 60 gray, the rate of level or grade three and grade Sorry, four reactions goes above 40%, which is unacceptable. So you're killing too many people if you go above 60 gray. For Y90, I can do low bar doses without causing significant toxicity of 80 to 150 gray. And I can do segmentectomy doses when I do a sub-segmental dose, I can go as high as 1,000 gray relative to the 60 gray that you're capable of giving with SBRT. And so as you can imagine, you, you put in that much radiation dose into a tumor, it's more likely to die. And so we do have some results that show that um, you know, you look at general response for taste, it's 25, 27 to 45% complete response at 30, 30 days, overall survival between 18 months and 33 months. So that's the benefit you get. For cholangiocarcinoma, when we do Y90, 22 month survival benefit. Uveal melanoma, eight to 15 month survival benefit. That's a terrible, terrible disease. Nothing else works at all. Um, average growth for lobectomy patients um, when you're trying to get them to surgery for the left lobe is 21 to 47%. And you're also growing the other side of the liver. So it's helpful from that standpoint because you're also treating the tumor. And when you look at segmentectomy dosing, which is when you put the tumor that you dosed for a whole lobe into just one segment and you can put between 500 and 1,000 gray into that tumor, the response at six months were 86% and 49%. Medium time to progression was 2.4 years. 72% of patients, no progression at five years. Median survival, 6.7 years. And that's in a paper from Northwestern. And then um, for time to progression was 11.1 .1 months in a segmentectomy group and in a taste ablation group. And this is from Cedar sinais The time to progression was 12.1 .1 months, which is not really different. And so the, the issue is you're, you're talking about an objective response rate of 98%, and you're talking about a median survival of 6.7 years. Well, so if you look at oncology in general, the definition of cure is seven years. And keep in mind that if you do a hepatectomy for HCC, the median survival is 50% at five years. And so we're getting to the point where you're talking about actually curing cancer, not just treating cancer. 
um, with some of these treatments, in particular radiation segmentectomy. So ablation, we talked a little bit about that. We can do ethanol ablation. It's really, really helpful with HCC. You can do it in dangerous locations in the liver without causing much trouble. You don't compromise their liver function much as long as you're a little bit careful about not getting it into the hepatic veins. And, um, you know, it's a 70% cure if the tumor is less than two centimeters and has very, very low risk of tract seeding, although there's only certain tumors for which it's useful. Cryoablation, it's literally an ice cube on the end of a stick. It's pretty cool. This was actually the first ablation modality performed by Dr. James Arno in 1819 on breast tumors. He could get, he could get the temperature probe down to minus 24 degrees centigrade. Colder temps with refrigerant being invented in 1877, first used for actual cryoablation with the refrigerant in 1907, and first used in the breast by Dr. James Arno. And then in the brain secondary, I don't know why they go straight from the breast to the brain, but that was the second site that it was actually um, used. And now it's used all over the body. And basically what it is, is you have a liquid compressed gas that goes down a needle, and then there's a choke, which allows the gas to rapidly expand. And for those of you that have any recollection whatsoever of the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And so when you massively expand the size of the gas, um, then you, you end up, rapidly rapidly heating the gas the gas has to absorb energy which then cools the tissue around the probe and so we can actually cool these probes to minus 157 degrees uh, centigrade so that's pretty cold um, with a standard cryoablation probe and we can do it in the you know and it can again be done in very dangerous sites like in this case you're seeing you know a um, done for kidney cancer 97.5% 90, five-year survival, 100% disease-specific five-year survival for the largest review that's ever been done of renal cell carcinoma, so super effective for renal cell. And then one, three, and five-year survival rates for percutaneous cryoablation for non-small cell lung cancer with tumor diameters of two to three seven centimeters, 97.4, 72.9, and 55.7. So that's actually pretty good even compared to surgery and overall survival, um, it's better than, don't tell anybody I told you, but it's better than SBRT because SBRT causes um, a little bit of fibrosis of the lungs and all these patients have COPD. And so disease specific survival, it's the same for SBRT, but overall survival is actually not as good as that um, for, uh, um, for SBRT. And so this is an area that likely to continue to grow in terms of our, our interventions. And then the other beautiful thing about this relative to SBRT is when you have this lung cancer, um, you know, as I told you, they originally didn't like us too much because we weren't getting them tissue so that they could do any kind of analysis. Now, especially in the age of molecular medicine, um, we see these lung tumors, and I'll tell you, this happened this week in Tumor Board. Um, they're, they're like, okay, we need a biopsy of this one and this one, but then we also need to treat these. And I'm like, well, you know, I can biopsy and then immediately ablate through the same hole that I did the biopsy. And obviously that was a very attractive idea to them because I can do both lungs, I can do multiple lesions. In fact, the European guidelines now say up to five lesions in the lung can be treated um, with cryoablation. Um, uh, and that's an appropriate thing to do because it doesn't affect lung function at all, which is a little different from um, from uh, SBRT. SBRT, you have to be careful not to go above 50 gray to the surrounding lung parenchyma, and you, you run out of the ability to do extra because you've used up all of that 50 gray, so you can't keep going giving more. And so that's a benefit of cryo is that it can be repeated over and over and over again if we want to. Microwave is very, very interesting in terms of its place in the ablation space. Um, however, I'll tell you, it's a little undeveloped, and it's probably gonna be massively important in the next couple of years. But if you look at this microwave for food, not people in 1946, right? That's when it was first invented. Um, when, you know, a, a physician or a physician scientist was doing experiments, he was a physicist and a, and a physician, and he had a chocolate bar in his pocket and he was working with microwaves and it melted the chocolate bar in his pocket. So that's how he figured out that maybe he should not A, be in the microwaves and B, maybe they could use this for something. But it wasn't until it actually 1985 that it started being used in terms of ablative. And they originally were using it to try to do like what we do with a xenon torch to be hemostatic, right? For the cut edge of the liver and things like that. 
but it turned out it was terrible for that because it burned too deep. And so that's when it started to be used for ablation. But the the first of the third generation probes, which are the ones that really actually are good, um, wasn't until 2010. So you can see all the data collection that we've done with microwave, which is probably better um, in most cases than the other ablation modalities, has only been since 2010. So you can see this is an area that's rapidly, rapidly developing. Um, and these are just some numbers for resection versus um, uh, the numbers for HCC microwave ablation for the same tumors. And you can see the numbers are not a whole lot different um, for these, for microwave versus surgery. So, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting when you think about it, we're getting to the point where we're starting to challenge the surgeons a little bit in terms of what we treat. Now, um, you gotta play nice with others and you gotta learn to stay in your lane. But the beautiful thing is a lot of the patients in the group that was treated with microwave weren't, weren't candidates for surgery. And so you're giving them similar survival to better surgical candidates who actually were candidates for survival. So this is very exciting because it's, it's moving in the direction of cure for these treatments. And actually currently um, ablation for HCC under three centimeters, the, the National Cancer Care Network guidelines, which are what governs what we do in the United States, actually recommends for a, a tumor less than three centimeters, it should be getting ablation and not resection, just so you know. That's not my opinion, that's what the actual guidelines say. Guidelines written primarily by people who are not interventional radiologists, by the way. So just a couple of examples of some interesting stuff you can do. This is a guy who got SBRT for HCC in the liver. He developed a recurrence. Uh, they can't re-irradiate it. They put too much dose into his liver already, plus the stomach is right on top of this thing and they don't want to burn a hole in the stomach. So they asked me to take care of it. And so what I did was actually put a needle into this lesion, kind of at the, at the neck of the lesion, air dissected the, uh, the adjacent abdominal wall away, couldn't get the stomach to go away, but it doesn't really matter because I was doing cryo and was able to effectively ablate this and this lesion was killed on follow-up imaging. So that's just some of the tricks you can do to actually ablate things that otherwise would not be addressable from a surgical or a SBRT uh, approach. Here's another guy, this guy has metastatic colorectal cancer. He has all of his disease on the right, Sorry. but one lesion on the left. And that one lesion on the left is a big problem, right? Because he massively responded to chemo, which means he's likely to do very, very well if he gets a hepatectomy for his cancer, but you can't take off both sides of the liver because that means you don't have a liver anymore, right? So uh, he can't get a hepatectomy if he still has this lesion on the left. And so the surgeon said, well, can we do anything about this? And I said, absolutely, I can do something. You can see it's sitting right on top of the hepatic veins the two bright things behind the dark spot, that tumor is the dark spot, the two bright things are the, are the, um, the segment four and the segment two, three branches of the left uh, hepatic vein. So you really don't wanna burn those because if you cook those, that's a big problem because then he can't drain that side of his liver anymore. And you can also see that it's five millimeters from the base of the heart. So that seems like a problem too in terms of not causing any trouble. So what we did is I actually put a catheter into the, into the left, port, uh, left hepatic vein, um, uh, anchored it right at the spot the tumor was, and you can see I have a sheet there and then I have a catheter through it that has markers on it. And what I did was cold infuse the hepatic vein with saline while I burned this by putting a needle right on top of it. So there's the, my catheter in the hepatic vein right where that tumor is. And then I put a microwave needle using a combination of x-ray because I knew that my sheath was sitting right on top of it and a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, uh, spin CT. That's what that picture you're seeing is what's called a spin CT, which is a fancy thing we can do to get a low quality CT with fluoroscopy. And then if you see all the bright stuff in the bottom picture, that's actually um, a mixture of saline and contrast that I infused on top of the liver to move the lesion away from the heart so that I wouldn't burn the heart. That's called hydrodissection. And also, if you look at the x-ray picture on the left side of the frame, 
that's what that little tube is that's kind of extending across. I put a compy on top of the liver so that I could cold infuse on top of the liver to protect the heart while I did the ablation. And the, the ablation mate was a little bit bigger than the tumor itself. And this is the guy's liver at two year follow up off of chemo for two years with no recurrence of disease at two two years. So again, I told you it's about a seven year survival benefit if you can actually ablate or if you can actually do surgery in these patients. So this is a 45 year old guy with three little kids who is probably going to get at least seven years of survival as a result of this therapy. And so that's really powerful when you talk about it in those. And we can ablate some pretty big tumors. This is a guy with neuroendocrine tumor. I've embolized him a bunch of times, which is why you see that bright stuff in the liver. And so you know, I put three ablation probes in that thing, cook it pretty hard with microwave, and that's using the new wave system, which allows you to ablate bigger things. And you can see that tumor was much, much bigger prior to when he came back. Uh, three months later, you can see it's shrinking down. And the problem with neuroendocrine tumor is it causes a lot of symptoms. They get nausea, they get flushing, they get diarrhea. And this guy, you know, he's a football coach. He's got five kids, so he needs to, like, be home taking care of his kids and his football team, not uh you know dealing with all of those side effects and basically this large tumor was his only active tumor in the liver and so by cooking it his symptoms went away completely and he went back to living his life doing his normal stuff this is an hcc um just to go on she's a, a bar owner which i think is hilarious she doesn't drink but she owns a bar so i don't know if that's like you know cosmic karma or something because alcohol is one of the biggest reasons for hepatitis C or for uh, cirrhosis and uh, HCC. But she's got a huge HCC, way too big to operate on. And so they asked us, hey, can you try to shrink this so that we can operate and we'll do a, And then you'll also hypertrophy the other side. You can see her AFP is very high. She's young, no other medical history. And so we did Y90 twice to the, to the right lobe of the liver. And this thing shrunk so much. And you can see her left lobe is now huge. Um, this thing shrunk so much, and her AFP, which was 40,000, went to three, which is normal. They they got they spent two years arguing about what they should do about this, and then they decided, well, we should just transplant her because now she has no active disease. And so they ended up transplanting her, and you can see that's the left lobe right there, and it's huge relative to what it was before, and the HCC shrunk down. And in fact, this is a picture of her tumor, which they sectioned 17 times because they couldn't believe that they didn't find any viable tumor at all. And so this completely killed the tumor. And those little like dots that you're seeing, that's the yttrium 90. That's what the glass beads look like in the tumor. And so all of this is just scar. So we completely cooked her tumor, which is why for two years she didn't have anything. And this is another lady. Um, she has one breast met and it's that 20 centimeter monster in the middle of her liver. And they don't wanna operate even though, you know, again, um, doing an operation would extend her survival because it was too big and taking up too much space and pushing on the liver too much. So I hit it twice with Y90 and it was dead. And you can see it's the dark, the bright area is the tumor on the first one. And it's, you know, and then the dark area is where the tumor was on the second one. And not only has it shrunk, like the volume is decreased by about fourfold but now there's actually no FDG avidity in this tumor. And she ended up going to surgery because she did hypertrophy her left lobe as well. And they, again, didn't find any viable tumor in this lady. I cooked her a lot harder. I put over a thousand gray in that thing. So that I was much more aggressive on this lady. But um, again, no viable tumor when they actually did her resection. And that was her only site of disease. And so they were able to leave her off of chemo because we were able to take care of all visible disease. And this is becoming more and more common, especially in the age of immunotherapy, you know, um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about in terms of future directions. In immunotherapy, you know, it's different than other chemos. When we first came out with chemos, um, there was cytotoxic therapy and that's it, right? So you're, when you were talking about response rates, it was either um, no response, response or growth of tumor, right? There was no stable disease at that time because cytotoxic agents they don't kill stuff, they're not working. And so there was no such thing as stable disease. But then we started coming out with some chemos that were, uh, you know, tumor tumorostatic, like um, in particular things like serapinib and sinitinib, which don't ever actually shrink tumors, but they stabilize it and then the patients live longer. And so then we had stable disease that we added in. 
But then you get to immunotherapy and it gets even more confusing because you treat somebody with metastatic disease all over the place with immunotherapy and everything responds. And then after they've been treated for a year or two, sometimes you have only one tumor that grows. And the, the, they call that oligoprogressive metastatic disease, okay? And the problem is you don't want to take them off the immunotherapy because you know they have cancer everywhere, but their body is actually holding that at bay. But they have that one tumor that's growing. And you don't have a ton of different mechanisms for immunotherapy, so it's not like you can sh switch to you know, a different mechanism by and large. Most of them are based on either a CTLA-4 or PD-1 um, or PD-L1, which is what atezolizumab is actually done. But the idea is, so we start participating in the care of those patients by doing local ablations of those oligoprogressive metastatic disease. Because then you can leave them on their immunotherapy because it's only one mutant clone that's kind of escaped from the immunotherapy. And so you can almost think about that as local disease. You can almost think about that as just a single-sided disease. And again, these patients have metastatic disease, so nobody really wants to operate on them. But you can actually prolong their survival, keep them on their therapy by doing local ablations of solitary growing lesions. And often, because this is lung cancer is the primary place where this is super useful, you're either ablating the you know, the, the, uh, you know, a new, a lesion in the lung, or you're ablating a bone lesion, or you're ablating the, the adrenal gland. Those are kind of the most normal places, peri, periapatic lymph nodes, which is sometimes a little bit sphincter tone inducing, but um, those are the kinds of areas that you're ablating, and you can really do good things for these patients, even though you think, oh, it's a local treatment for a person who has widely metastatic disease, but in the age of all of these, you know, uh, immunotherapies, this becomes increasingly important. And um, just to give you an idea of why everybody gets so excited about these, this is a lady that has HCC. I taste her. She had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease related to her diabetes and metabolic syndrome. I taste her. Her tumor laughed at me. Uh, I, we put her on serafinib and I taste her again. It laughed even harder. And so the picture you're seeing on the left, at this point, she has a albumin less than one She's short of breath from an HCC met in her thyroid that's pushing on her trachea. And all of this in the abdomen you're seeing, that's all tumor, right? And so she's in terrible shape, ECOG-3, not really a candidate for a haircut, let alone anything else. And so we put her on pembrolizumab using, you know, uh, at the time it was not approved for that. So it was like just, you know, sort of a, a mercy dosing of it. And basically her, her AFP, which was uh, 300,000, went down to normal and all of her tumors shrank, her leg swelling went away, her shortness of breath went away, and she ended up with two and a half years of survival with no side effects at all from the immunotherapy. So, um, you know, not all patients respond to immunotherapy, 15 to 20% of all patients actually do, but some of them respond so well that they get a tremendous amount of survival. And the ones who do respond, all of them get excellent survival out of it. So this is why this is so uh, important and interesting and why we're going to have to participate in this a whole bunch. Because not only are we going to have to do biopsies, but now they're inventing intratumoral in immunotherapies. And there's one of these that's currently approved and it's for melanoma, but all the re there's you know many, many of them that are in clinical trials where you inject something directly into a tumors, which actually stimulate the immune system to attack that particular area specifically. And then that also sensitizes the rest of the body to kill the tumor in other places. And so this is another sort of wrinkle on immunotherapy that we're all gonna have to get real good at because you're gonna be the ones doing the injections for these patients, not um, you know the surgeons or the oncologists. And then in addition, there's also other really exciting new things kind of on the horizon, which we're starting to do, but um, are, you know, sort of in development. The, the top picture on the left side, that's what's called the Renovo RX catheter, and it's a double balloon catheter. And it's on the arterial side right next to a pancreatic cancer. And you put it in a place where you don't see any blood vessels, and it actually um, uh, elutes drug into the tumor. It pushes it through the wall of the artery into the tumor. And pancreas cancer is really, really desmoplastic, so it doesn't have good blood vessels. 
And so you can get a ton of chemo into the tumor without getting a lot of secondary side effects. So that's incredibly important and interesting and is currently in clinical trials. So that's probably going to be coming down the pipe by the time some of you are interventionalists. And then peptide receptor radiation therapy. I don't know if any of you have heard of Ludothera. They do give that systemically. And it's basically, um, you know, it's, it's a radioactive substance bound to an antibody that you then can bind to tumor cells to kill those tumor cells or radiate the tumor cells by having a specific uh, antibody. And um, currently, this is clinically approved for prostate cancer, some specific prostate cancers, and for, um, for a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor. And so we're already doing this, but it turns out that you get a lot better on-target to off-target effect with some of these things by doing it catheter-directed. So in Europe, they're doing PRRT with patients with tons of liver mets from their neuroendocrine tumor with catheter-directed infusion directly into the liver because you get a lot more um, coverage of the tumor that way. <coughs> and then the other thing I'm showing you here is what's called nanonife or irreversible electroporation. So many of you who did transfection experiments when you were undergraduates and such, or during your PhD, um, you, you were transfecting cells by um, doing rapid um, polarization, depolarization, which opens up channels in the, in the cells um, based on the uh, sodium potassium channels. And so you can, get de you can get RNA and stuff into the cells in or and plasmids into the cells in order to actually treat them. So irreversible electroporation, you kill the cells. And the beautiful thing about it is it doesn't actually cause any thermal da damage at all. And so in places with huge blood vessels going through it, i.e. the head of the pancreas, um, where patients can be non-surgical candidates because there's too much vascular involvement, you can put in your IRE probes, you kill all the cells in between the probes, it doesn't kill, you just put them on heparin for a few days, and despite the fact you've killed all the cells in those arteries, the cells will actually grow back as long as they don't thrombose. Um, and so you put them on heparin for a few days, and then they re-endothelize after a few days, and so even though there's blood vessels that you can't kill because it would kill the patient going right through these tumors, you can still ablate the tumors even though that that's happening because you get a, an extra safety margin related to this um, IRE. And so that's kind of where we are and where we're going. And this is, again, becoming a huge part. And I didn't talk a lot about pain. If you want to talk about pain and IR, that's another lecture. That's, again, more future directions because that's becoming something that we do more and more, but not something we do a ton, ton, aside from here and at, at Emory and at uh, Medical University of Wisconsin. We do, a, the three of us do a ton of it, but in most places, it's still sort of building up in clinical practice. But it is something that's coming down the pipe, but I didn't talk about it because we don't have time, it's too much. So um, with that, I will end, and if, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take your questions. I have a question for you, Dr. Johnson. Sure. Okay, so I'm on this like work group for SIR and we talk a lot about economics. And so I wanted to ask you a more business related question. And so like we went kind of through the economics of like CMS and like what they're proposing to fund and like cut costs for. And it seems like like IO is like a, a massively expansive field within interventional radiology and like other kind of portions of IR such as like PAD work are either shrinking or stagnating. Can you like comment on kind of like where you see, if you had a crystal bar, ball, where would you see like an average IR um, practitioner and maybe a decade whenever, you know, all of us are practitioners, like how much of their work would be IO versus like something like PAD versus everything else? So I think that it's variable depending on where you go. It's hard to escape from IO because we're so important in terms of diagnosis in particular, so you're gonna be doing biopsies no matter where you go. But there are some practices that are doing 80, 90% um, PAD. You know, one of my co-fellows, because he works in the Kaiser system and IR doctors are much cheaper uh, in terms of the materials that we use and we're quicker than vascular surgeons. If you work in Kaiser, California, and you're a vascular surgeon, you're not allowed to do endovascular work because they want the IR doctors to do it because they're cheaper. And so in terms of the economics, I wouldn't say that, um, I'd say once they start doing a comparative 
um, uh, effectiveness studies that I think it's going to be a big problem for some of these specialties. Because, I mean, I'm, it sounds arrogant, but in every single time that they've compared an IR doctor to another specialty doing the same thing, we are always quicker and we always have lower complications. And so that's true with chest ports, that's true with IVC filters, that, and it's true with peripheral, it's peripheral arterial disease, right? The people who tell you what you can do in a Kaiser system are actuaries who are looking at the actual numbers and they don't care whose feelings they hurt. They just say, look, this is how we do it. So I think if you go to the right situation, you go to a Kaiser type system or you go to um, Cleveland Clinic or that sort of thing, managed care systems, then I think there's still a ton of PAD. You know, my friends in Kaiser, Colorado, they're doing uterine artery embolizations all day long because um, it turns out that patients do better if they get uterine artery embolizations because it's way cheaper and they actually recover a lot quicker than they do for a hysterectomy. And so by and large, they're doing a whole bunch of uterine artery embolizations because it's a very safe and effective procedure in that system that saves the system money. And this is gonna be true across multiple other benign um, embolization practices, including prostate, which we're doing now, um, you know, gastric artery embolization is definitely something we're going to be doing a couple of years from now because people lose a lot of weight and that can be very helpful and it doesn't cause scarring. And, you know, a gastric bypass is a $90,000 surgery where it costs 6000 bucks for an embolization. And so it's cheap relative to a lot of the alternatives. And so I do think benign, embol benign embolization, benign vascular work, benign, you know, uh, sort of peripheral vascular work, I don't think that's going away. And I think if you're in private practice, you'll do a lot more of that. But if you're in a major academic center, IO is sort of the monster that's eating IR. I mean, probably, you know, if you look at me specifically, um, at the University of Colorado, where we had a lot of our uh, pain work was being done by MSK in our particular setting, um, I was doing 80% um, oncology work. 80% of what I was doing was oncology. And I was doing almost zero, except on call for any of the kind of vascular work that you're talking about. Here, I do a ton of pain work. So I probably do 60 to 70% pain, but you know, half of that's oncology work as well, right? So if you looked at the oncology work that I'm doing, plus the pain work for the oncology patients, it's still well over half of my total practice is oncology. And I can't see all the patients that are being referred to me because this is such a growth area. So I do think it becomes a huge chunk. And in some ways that's good for IR because the comparator procedures, it turns out are incredibly expensive. PRRT costs $300,000 to get a full course of PRRT. If you're on an immunotherapy, it's $20,000 in infusion until um, the PD-1 inhibitors lose their patents. And $20,000 in infusion every two weeks is $500,000 a year. If you're getting a CAR-T therapy, CAR-T therapy costs, you know, $1.5 million. It's the most expensive thing we do to you in medicine. And these are all really good therapies, but it turns out when you look at what it actually costs for us to do the procedures that sort of complement this, it's, it's chump change when you talk about a Y90 costing 25 grand when, you know, one infusion of, you know, of nivolumab plus ipilimumab is more expensive than that. And they're going to get multiple infusions. So I do think it's nice in terms of there's a space for us, not just in terms of improving outcomes, but also we're always cheaper than surgeons because it's quicker. And um, a lot of the stuff that the oncologists are doing are very expensive relative to us. So it gives a lot of space for growth. I think is is the the long answer to a short question. And a quick follow up to that is um, when I initially was thinking about medical school, I went and hired a uh, shadowed an IR doctor and at the Lexington Medical Center, uh, so up near Columbia. And it's a relatively large hospital system, but it's nothing like MUSC. And they were doing Y90 there, and as well as like they were doing microwave ablation. So how much do you think that these IO procedures can diffuse from an academic setting into private practice out in the, like even these more rural communities? So microwave and Y90, they diffuse deep into those communities because cancer is in those communities. 
streets. And in particular, in South Carolina, if you're talking about Hilton Head or Myrtle Beach, it's all old people, right? What do they all die of? They all die of heart disease and cancer, right? And so there's tons and tons of work, and there's not quite enough people to do that work now. So even in a small community, you can actually build quite a robust practice doing these kinds of procedures. And people are doing Y90 in small hospitals all around the country because it's effective. And so you got cancer patients. The hospital really, really likes doing Y90 because the profit margin is great for the hospital. And, you know, and so, and it's a very low morbidity condition in that patients usually come in, they get their procedure, they go home. They're not staying in the hospital, right? That's part of the power of IR is that we're not keeping people in the hospital. And so the, the lack of inpatient stays that's associated with this actually is part of why this is so powerful in the context of what Does that makes sense, Nathan? Yes, sir. I appreciate the answer. But yes, Columbia is definitely doing Y90. Um, in fact, you know, I trained one of the guys in Columbia, so I know he's doing Y90. And, uh, you know, Asheville, North Carolina. I knew a guy who's doing a ton of kyphoplasty ablations for spine tumors, and he's also doing Y90, and he's also doing microwave, and he's also doing cryoablation of lung tumors. So this is stuff that can diffuse. You just have to bring it with you. And unfortunately, if you look at the distribution of interventional radiology around this country, there are a lot of places that are underserved with respect to IR, and that's one of the big problems is that, you know, there's more, there's more work than there are people. And so when you go to some of these more rural places, the problem is not that it couldn't be done. The problem is there's not somebody there to do it. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Johnson, so <clears throat> the, way, the way this presentation was, basically for me, it seems like IO has nothing but upsides. Um, and obviously I want to believe that, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more about fears in the future of yours or even just general things that, uh, for example, like surgery has, o is always going to have a certain contraindication for certain approaches. And it seems like IO with all this different technology and approaches going forward, seems like the sky's the limit. Um, do you have any certain like things in the future that you feel would be the cap for IO? And if so, what are they? And if not, then, you know, great. Well, presumably they'll deliver, deliver or develop better and better chemotherapies, and they may develop chemotherapies that preclude the need for some of these procedures, I, I suppose. That would be the answer, is that if they come up with immunotherapies that are so great that they kill everything, then that would probably preclude the need for interventional therapies like this. I think that that's highly unlikely, uh, given my knowledge of what actually is involved in immunotherapy, because immunotherapy only works if you have cells that you can recognize. And if they mutate either the proteasome or the MHC class one, which is 60% of all tumors, then there's nothing you can do. You can't recognize it because they're not presenting antigens that can actually be recognized. And so I think, I do think a little bit the sky is the limit, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, you have to be okay with doing biopsies. I like doing biopsies. I like doing crazy biopsies. I did one in the aortico-pulmonary window yesterday, uh, or uh, Friday, I mean. Um, that was a little scary because I was biopsying right up against the aorta in the chest going through the mediastinum. Um, but it saved the patient an open surgical biopsy, and so I feel pretty good about that because I actually helped that patient out. And he went home the same day as opposed to if he had gotten a thoracotomy in order to do a mediastinal biopsy would have been in the hospital for several days. So it does sound a little Pollyanna, and maybe that sounds unrealistic to you, but I, I would posit that if you look at the history of interventional radiology with respect to the vascular surgery um, space, where we were saying, oh my gosh, this is going to be so great for all of these vascular surgery techniques, and people are like, oh no, surgery is never, the surgery will get better, blah, blah, blah. What are they doing for all these vascular surgery conditions now? Are they doing any open surgeries? They're doing a couple, not that many. The vascular surgeons basically had a meeting at one point back in around 2002, and they said, look, if we don't learn this, these, if we don't learn these techniques that the IR guys are doing that we told them don't work, then we're all going to be out of a job because it's very clear that their, their procedures are better than ours. So I would say the risks are that we get so good that other people decide they have to get into it, like the surgical oncologists decide they have to learn how to do 
embolization because we're taking all their work away from them. So that I would say is probably the biggest risk. Exactly the same thing that happened with vascular surgery. But even in that space, I will tell you, in a survey in 2017 of that was done at SIR of private practice doctors, 60% of them have a significant component of peripheral vascular disease in their practice. So that's not work that's completely gone. You have to you have to do it the right way. You have to be a real doctor, which is something I, I argue about all the time. Some doctor, some IR docs just want to do the procedures and kind of like, you know, leave some change on the dresser and then leave. But um, you have to manage them like a real doctor. And if you do that, you're really not, you're not stoppable by these other services because you have a bunch, you can do a bunch of things they can't. And you can do it in a way that they can't, which is way more minimally invasive. Even when you look at um, the surgeons who do the laparoscopic um, liver ablations where they put in the probes and then they do the ablations, those patients still stay in the hospital for a couple of days, two, three days. Mine go home the same day when I do ablations and my outcomes are better because I can see exactly what I'm ablating. And so it is a little Pollyanna, but I would say that the biggest risk is that they decide that we're taking too much of their work and that they have to learn how to do what I do. But I think there's even ways to kind of protect against that, especially if you learn a lot about these interventional pain techniques. Because with these interventional pain techniques, they're not going to be able to do those, and you can have your patients be even less symptomatic from the procedures you do. And so I often do this. It's a, it's a little way to cheat to make the patients even less have, le you know, you're doing a big liver ablation or an embolization of the liver, and you know you're going to make the patient, the neuroendocrine patient, miserable when you embolize the entire right side of their liver. So I'll do a celiac plexus block. Um, with liposomal bupivacaine and solumedrol, which would help them anyway, but also gives them three days where they don't have any pain from the liver. And so all of the symptoms that they would have otherwise had, I'm mitigating by using medications in a way that only I can do. Me and the anesthesiologist, we're the only ones who know where the nerves are to actually get to them to, to knock them out. And so I would say, the combination of being able to do some of these local regional therapies for pain in addition to the oncology stuff, you know, especially over the, I don't know if you've looked a lot at the, the cancer literature, but over the last several years, quality of life has become a huge, huge thing that the NIH actually tracks and looks at. So a chemotherapy has to not only extend life, but also chemotherapies that just make life better, that those still get approved now even if they don't cause a survival benefit, but if they make people's lives better, they like survive with less symptoms, that's becoming a very major part of the assessment of oncologic treatment. And so if I can get everybody doing, you know, interventional radiology treatments to these tumors and stuff, and then also doing nerve blocks and, you know, nerve ablations in appropriate circumstances and doing all these secondary things to try to make them less symptomatic, I don't know how anybody's gonna stop me. Be honest. Yeah, no, I mean the way you uh the way you describe at least like the the possibilities, like I only posed that question really just to see if you even thought there was a limit. And it sounds like you believe in the field that that, that can basically take over so many, you know, different aspects of different fields. And I, I think that's super exciting. Well, and it's a little bit of a running joke in IR, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's a T-shirt that they sold at SIR the year before the pandemic, 2018, that said, um, Society of Interventional Radiology, inventing procedures for other specialties since 1973, because that was the year that SIR was founded. And, you know, you, you think about some of the things you think about as being related to other specialties, cardiac catheterization, do you think that was invented by a cardiologist? Uh, no, no, it was not. It was actually, you know, sort of invented by interventional radiologists, and it was only after cardiologists could, they could kind of smell the money coming from the other side of the of the of the hospital. That's when they started getting into it because you can't hide money from a cardiologist. But all of the cardiac cath techniques that you hear about, those were all invented by interventional radiology. So. You know, a lot of these techniques are being used by other specialties, but the fact is none of them are quite as good at imaging as you. None of them have secondary understandings of different organ systems that are in the same area. It's sort of the same thing as reading a CT scan. 
you know, a general surgeon knows what the liver is, know what, knows what the segmental anatomy is, and may do a really good job reading what's happening to tumors in the liver. But if they're a, if they're a abdominal surgeon, they're not going to look at the lymph nodes in the cardiophrenic angle because that's not what they do. And so I think that this is an area where your specialization in conjunction with your ability to be more broad in your understanding of organ systems actually makes you difficult to, to it makes it so that you can do things in a way that other people struggle more with. Other, other surgical specialties struggle more with. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? All right. Um, so everyone who's going to watch this later, uh, thanks for everyone who tuned in. Um, that was a really great lecture. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think uh, a lot of you all will too once you guys watch it. Um, thank you to Dr. Johnson for being here, for answering questions, but also giving a really nice look at uh, interventional oncology and, and a lot of the things that are being used today, and also the future directions, which is super exciting. Um, so um, yeah, thank you again, Dr. Johnson. Uh, we appreciate it. No problem. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.